Well, hello. <clears throat> uh, before this talk starts, I'm going to give you a disclaimer that I am not actually a love guru. I'm an on-chain analyst, but I'm going to give some good news to the audience in here today. Um, so it turns out the numbers say that if you put crypto in your dating profile, you will have 33% chance higher of getting a date. And uh, particularly for the audience here, that's usually uh, male, uh, male dominated. It turns out that 50% of your marketability to women is based on your resources and status. So in effect, you must become a crypto OG. So <clears throat> what I'm going to do is get you up to speed with on-chain analysis so this can improve your dating life. And first thing I'm going to go over is traditional markets. So this is a price chart. Could be anything, any tradable asset, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Tesla slot, so forth. Um, you'll notice there's two dimensions to this uh, data. It's only price and time. And so here's another exhibit. This is a non-obvious market. This is one of um, the marketability of men. And it, again, it is price over time. SMV, by the way, stands for sexual market value within the dating game. So it peaks at 35 and decays after that. Just to complete it, this is uh, the SMV for women in the dating game. So all these things are markets. Um, if you want to go deeper to get insight, you know, you get stuff like this, right? This is the uh, value that men look for in women in long-term relationships. Looks, age, faithfulness. And it turns out there's two markets. There's a the short-term market, which is um, what I'll show you next, and the long-term market for long-term relationships. The short-term hookup market, 80% looks. So this is an idea of what we're getting to with on-chain analysis. We are lucky and blessed in this world of on-chain. All these networks drop transactions on a blockchain which we can read, and from that we can build up a, a deep picture of fundamentally what's going on. So I'll take you through a history of within the Bitcoin world, which was the oldest blockchain with the most data. Um, the first semblance of this world where we could measure on-chain metrics was the proposal of measuring not only uh, t the transactions moving between investors, but just looking at how long those coins had stayed latent in a wallet before they moved. And this concept was called destruction. Bitcoin days destroyed in 2011. And it's, it's really the notion of that the guy that's the OG that's had their coins in the wallet for, say, eight years and they bought it for $100 and sold it for, say, 30000 has more weight than the guy that bought it last week and sold it straight into the market. So in 2019, I created this model, uh, the CVDD floor, and that is that was created in where the purple dot is on screen, um, 2019, we had like three bottom bear market bottoms and um, it did predict the bottom price for the following bear market. And again, this is working on the idea that um, if someone who had bought their coins from an eon ago for $100 and sold at a much higher price, then it must mean the newcomers into this network are um, perceiving a much higher valuation. So it's using that to create a prediction around the the floor price. Come uh, 2013, 2014, we started looking at the volume moving between investors. Um, and from that, uh, I created MVT ratio, which was uh, really the first market on-chain metric that we had. Uh, it works a little bit like price earnings ratio. On the one hand, you're looking at the volume moving on the blockchain between investor to investor. And if that activity is high against the valuation of the network, the market cap, then you get a low ratio, like a low PE ratio. Um, and you'll see that in these zones where the PE ratio, the MVT ratio is low, we set up for a, a bullish run on the market. Um, so that's an old metric, uses volume, but a lot of that volume now has moved to exchanges, which is blind to on-chain. So this, this is a metric that's probably past its use-by date. Uh, gives you an idea, a lot of things are changing quickly in this world. 
uh, Nick Carter came along in 2018 with Realize Cat with his team at Coinmetric, and that birthed a new series of, of kind of analysis. And it, we're, here we're looking at the cost basis of when investors bought into their coin, and that, that branches out into a whole um, number of metrics around um, profit and loss that you can detect on chain. On screen is uh, an example where we're looking at the cost basis for the short term holders versus long term holders when they cross and dip, when the short term guys get wrecked deep enough in the bear markets to be around the zone or below the zone of long term guys, uh, that's a market bottom. Um, many, many signals you can build from this. Here's a nice chart, um, it's a pretty chart. It's just a picture of um, the density map of really where people have bought their coins over time. Um, so this is around price discovery. <clears throat> and lately in 2022, Glassnode have been uh, working on clustering the address spaces to get an idea of the cohorts um, and what activity is happening in a much more um, sort of atomic level. So this is a heat map of whales to shrimps selling into the market or buying in the market versus price. So that gives you an idea of some of the things we can do with on-chain analysis. Um, so enough of that and we can just pull up some charts and have a look at what's going on in the market currently. Um, one of my favorites is looking at what is happening on the exchanges. In the long term view, in 2017 you see that we had a lot of coins stack up in the exchanges and that was very much along um, the 2017 bull market where retail came in. They liked the experience using um, exchanges instead of managing private keys. And that sea change, a sea change happened around 2020, around the COVID crash, and that was where the institutions started coming in. High net worth offices, uh, Michael Saylor with um, the institutional drive of corporate treasuries, and you'll see that they started scooping coins off the exchanges and putting into custodial um, wallets. And so that, that switched the change. And what you're seeing here is very large players coming in to take those coins and accumulate. And very recently, we had um, a, a loss of trust post FTX, where further um, step change in, in coins moving off exchanges. So um, this next chart is coming from Glassnode, some of their research. Uh, what we're seeing here is really, um, in this case, the flows of transactions going into exchanges and we're building up a heat map based on size and again you see in the early days around the 2017 era is there really an expansion of market cap and the transaction size are getting bigger as the whole um, industry is getting bigger and then come um, this era now we're seeing a drive downwards in transaction sizes, which is signaling retail is really coming in. But meanwhile, we are seeing very large whales and institutions have activity on exchanges also. So there's an um, expansion envelope. So uh, what you're seeing here is a maturity of the market on the Bitcoin network. Um, again, this is a visualization of the ratio of paper Bitcoins coming from the futures markets, perps, options, um, and that's a ratio with the very, very highly liquid coins that you can see on chain are moving between investors and likely to be traded. And so currently the paper markets reflect up to 30% more coins in the system over the actual coins that are being traded. So again, the paper markets are maturing. And um, some of the work that we do in Crest, we're mapping out the ecosystem of hedge funds. And this is their monthly profit and loss. Uh, and you can see just the sheer number of lines that we're tracking is getting denser as the herd's coming in. A lot of institutional hedge funds now are starting to uh, make, make their way into, um, into the, the, the trading of these assets. So um, that has brought something pretty interesting within um, Bitcoin as an asset. Uh, the blue line is the, well, here I'm picturing sharp ratio, which is the risk adjusted return of Bitcoin, and you'll see that Bitcoin was far ahead above any other macro asset as it was gaining adoption, expanding at a very, very rapid race in, uh, pace. And since the 2019-2020 era, we've seen that do a step change downwards. And unlike what we see a lot in the social um, Twitter space um, as Bitcoin is early, we're actually seeing the first signs of Bitcoin being traded like any other macro asset. The sharp ratio of Bitcoin now is the same as or similar to that of the S&P 500, 
gold. Um, if I put bonds in there, you'll see it's all trading within the same band of Sharpe ratio. So um, that's, that's it for Bitcoin. It is an asset that is very much maturing. Um, and just to get you up to speed with some of the on-chain world in Ethereum, um, the big story, as everyone knows, is the growth of DeFi, and this is it here, the total value locked up in the uh, Bitcoin ecosystem as a percentage of the market cap. And you can see that we had this huge exponential climb in mid-2020, and that has not really died off, even in the latest bear market. It's still holding on very strong to the capital. And you can see that rise in the fees. This is data coming from Forecast Labs, monitoring the fees um, being paid. Uh, very much a uh, indicator of the activity on these networks. And as Ethereum's taken a lot of this activity with a huge fees explosion, very expensive to use the network. You can see the L2s, layer 2s. Here I've pictured Polygon taking up some of that load. And you can see how it's impacted um, a lot of the, the fees cost on Ethereum. So a number of our twos are now taking that. So a lot of innovation happening and um, adoption is happening here. Um, and what I like in on-chain is that we can monitor all of these transactions. So here, the Aave lending pool, um, Glassnode has been able to build a liquidity heat map showing effectively the liquidation levels. So this is a picture of risk if you're in the lending pools. The, the, the white line here is, is Ethereum. Um, so we're, we're just seeing where the, the collateral there, if it drops um, below certain parts of the heat map, these are the, 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 um, the liquidation levels you will see. And similarly, on the, on the Uniswap DEX, this is where traders are putting their bids and asks. So a picture of liquidity. So um, very much um, in this world of DeFi, we would not get this data in the TradFi world. Maybe if you're a very large institution like Fidelity, you can pay for this data. But what's different in this world is it's open. All transactions you see here is open on the network and it's available to us. Uh, so very much um, an amazing space where we can see what's happening, except in this zone here. This is, we've got $125 billion of stable coins um, and none of it is on-chain verifiable. And that's because for the ones that really have worked and stood the test of time, they really back onto the banking system and use in US treasuries. So um, there's a lot of pa place for innovation here for us to build the very first uh, provably stable, um, like stable coin on the network. So it's still very early um, and I look forward to that being built. Um, some of the new frontiers I am seeing is um, within the trading zone where we're starting to get a big influx of hedge funds trading crypto. Um, I believe between one and 2,000 crypto trading firms now, all trading systematically. So some of my work is obviously to map this out. We did a survey and we found that only 6% are using on-chain data. And if you're really trading these markets, you want to use non-obvious data. And so it's very early in, in the game for this. And I'll just show an experiment I ran in 2022 just to see if this data actually works for short time frame trading. Um, and on the bottom of this chart, you can see fundamental signals coming down. What I'm doing here is just mapping out demand and supply from the key markets. The calendar futures, perpetual swap, flows on and off the exchanges, the spot exchanges, inferring demand and supply from the spot markets, and even looking into the network, looking at the liquidity movements between the, the strong hodlers and the, the traders, and seeing where the demand and supply is happening there. The algorithm looks at um, all of these measures of demand supply and comes up with a signal which is shown on the heat map at the top. Red when it's bearish, blue when it's bullish, and the strategy um, shows promise. You know, it is outperforming a huddle strategy. So what's interesting about this is this algorithm doesn't even know what price is doing. It's trading blind. It's just looking solely in the fundamentals without knowing what price is doing. So I maintain there's a lot of um, signal that is not being used within the quant world. Um, and then I'll close with a story, very much um, a story that um, we were exposed to within um, Crest. Uh, I, I asked uh, one of the hedge funds which I thought was closest to FTX in July, uh, sorry, November, early November the 7th, uh, 2022, and I said, hey guys, how do you feel about the solvency of FTX right now? 
posted a chart of Bitcoin collateral on FTX draining at a frightening rate. And so they, po they said back to me, hey Willie, we aren't worried about Alameda or FTX. FTX is probably the most transparent and well-run exchange in crypto. And this is what transpired pretty much 48 hours later. Um, at the 3AC collapse, there was a massive flow of collateral that left FTX exchange. And it seemed to me uh, there were insiders that knew what was going on and there was a consistent slide of collateral coming off that exchange and um, a final collapse in early November. So one month later, C's banking group, you know, they're a, 30, a $23 billion banking group, 23 billion of client assets. Their uh, alternative hedge fund um, approached us saying, now is the right time to build a crypto fund of funds allocating into crypto trading to generate a yield for uh, their clients. And um, what transpired was a very long conversation with the founder of the bank who was 70 and their risk team. It took weeks to get over the line. They thought, are you guys crazy post FTX? This place is the wild west. And this was the solution that we uh, sold to them. Uh, this is effectively the same sort of chart. We are now monitoring the collateral at all of our um, exchange counterparties, both Bitcoin, Ethereum, Stables, and we have a, a risk team that is monitoring the signal 24 seven. First response team gets in, they notify the second response team, which is a team of analysts who make the call whether or not this data goes out to our fund manager so they can take appropriate action. So um, we feel much more de-risked and with that, the insight here is though this industry is not well regulated and it's not in a mature stage of regulation, actually we do have an on-chain type of regulation. All these transactions are visible and we do have oversight just through the nature of these networks. And, and this has gone a long way to pushing this type of product into the TradFi world. Uh, there are billions, if going to trillions of dollars of assets ready to come in. The, the main game is to get the risk out of the equation. So overall, this era is moving very, very fast. Um, a lot of innovation is happening. I hope I've got you up to speed. This is just a quick, tour of what's happening on the on-chain world. And this is all so you can have um, more success in getting your dates. And I'll just uh, leave you with one final tip. When you get that first date, if you pay by Bitcoin, the data says you've got 74% chance of getting to the next date if you pay for dinner with Bitcoin. Thank you very much, everyone.